Welcome to Deep Impact Investing with Kimberly Griego-Kyle from Horizon Sustainable Financial Services. In this podcast, we talk about sustainable investing and how your portfolio reflects your values. Do your investments seek accountability from corporations that govern more and more of our society and even the lives we lead? Listen in as we explore the question, are you investing like you give a damn? Hello and welcome to Deep Impact Investing with Kimberly Grego Kyle from Horizon Sustainable Financial Services. Today, Kim has a special guest in the in the office, and that is Glenn Schiffbauer, the Executive Director of the Santa Fe Green Chamber of Commerce, a position he has held for about eight years. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? I'm great, Eric. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. You you brought Glenn in today. You've been working with Glenn for a while. I have. I, I think I've known Glenn for eight or nine years now. Is that right? Nice. That's right. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks for being here, Glenn. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think I met Glenn maybe nine years ago when he was getting ready to form the, uh, the initial steering committee for the Santa Fe Green Chamber. And he asked me to be part of that initial steering committee. So that's how I met Glenn. Nice. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll let you take it. I'm just going to sit back and listen and learn. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to give a little bit of background and, and Glenn, please, please jump in. I think you have a, a little more information as well, but, but some, some background on, on green chambers and the, the U S green chambers uh, were, were launched somewhere around 2011. Um, I think there was some, some rumblings maybe around 2009 that's that right. Yeah, yeah, they started in San Diego, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. down in in southern part of California. The there was a, a New Mexico Green Chamber, uh, statewide Green Chamber that was formed. I can't remember exactly what year that was, but probably around the same time the Santa Fe. Two thousand ten, actually, it was a little yeah. a little before we were. Yeah, so around then, and and the uh, the uh, the Santa Fe Steering Committee was formed in 2011, if I remember correctly. I think that's probably about right yeah. because we actually got up and going in 2012. Right, right. So, so um, I, and again, as I mentioned, I was a founding board member of that uh, initial steering committee and the actual board that was formed. Uh, and, and the purpose of most green chambers and, you know, the, for, you know that's slightly different than, than a traditional Chamber of Commerce, but the purpose is is to be a network organization for like minded businesses and community organizations. It's not just businesses, but a lot of nonprofits. I think are members as well. We do have a a, a good presence with the nonprofit, right? But but these are, are organizations and businesses that believe in sustainability practices, and these folks really want to see a better economic future through what we all tend to refer to as triple bottom line practices, practices that are um, not just about economic, but about environmental and social sustainability. So um, we we call that the triple bottom line. Exactly. People, planet and profit, right? Right. The three P's. Yeah. So, so I, I have a bunch of questions for you, Glenn, and hopefully you are prepared to answer all of those. <laughs> uh, I, w- I would like to hope so too. Yeah, yeah. So, so really, uh, you know, I want to know how have you seen the Santa Fe Green Chamber specifically in our community change over the last eight years that you've headed up this organization? Well, I think that we have become more of a, a go to for advocacy and policy issues. Just because we're in Santa Fe, you know, there is, as you know, a Las Cruces Green Chamber of Commerce, a Silver City Green Chamber of Commerce. There was a Taos Green Chamber of Commerce. But because of my location, which is, you know, looking out your window, you can see the roundhouse, I suspect. So everything kind of fell upon me to be the person that was lobbying and advocating. So I've seen that change and grow. Uh, since its inception where we were really focused on networking of like-minded businesses. And we still do that, but I think that we have been able to network around these really important issues here in Santa Fe and, and nationally too. The Santa Fe Green Chamber of Commerce has been involved with the methane mitigation issue that is a nationwide policy 
foible right now, but two years ago we had uh, President Barack Obama sign a BLM rule that we had really worked on here in the state of New Mexico. So I think that it's it's morphed a little bit towards advocacy, and also we've done some things programmatically that are actually putting into use some of the sustainability practices that we have preached about, but now through some of our uh, contracts with uh, other governmental entities, we're actually putting conservation into businesses, not just as an idea, but in reality. Right. And I, I love that. And and just so people know, the roundhouse here is what we refer to as our... Oh, yeah. Our, sorry. Because yeah, <laughs> people are, are listening that may not be in New Mexico. So I can actually see our um, state legislature out out my window. So th- that's what we call our roundhouse. But but yes, uh, lobbying, I think, has been a huge piece of what you do. And, and we have a part-time legislature. So one year, it's a 30-day session. The next year, it's a 60-day session. And I think you spend a lot of time during that 60-day session doing a lot of, of lobbying. I do. So yeah, and, and which is great, because I think that's a key thing in New Mexico, uh, especially over the last eight years, when we've had a Republican governor, where there's been a lot of work to do. And now we have a Democratic governor where I think this last session, it may have been a little bit easier to get some work done. It, it was, in, in one sense, it was easier because you, we were on the same page, I think, with the governor and and both the House and the Senate in, in terms of getting things signed. On the other hand, there's been this eight years of backlog. So it was the proverbial fire hose. Right. And, and that got to be a little counterproductive at times. But we had some good wins, I think. Yeah, which is which is very exciting. And and, and the methane issue is a, a huge issue here in New Mexico, but, you know, also across the country. So I would imagine that is um, has been in the forefront of, of what you've been doing. What are some of the other hot topics that you've lobbied on here in the state? Well, now that we have, as you said, an, a new administration, there have been, a, there has been a backlog on tax credits that are really beneficial to uh, renewable energies, electric vehicles, and so those appeared again. And we, because of the mass quantities of bills that were introduced this year, not all of those got through, but we did get some ground gained and some recognition of, yes, these are really great bills, and we'll get those maybe in the next go-round. We also have, it was really centered around one bill, but we did get uh, the Energy Transition Act here in New Mexico, which is going to put New Mexico as a leader in the country in terms of uh, getting to 80% carbon-free and clean energy by Initially, it was going to be 2045, but our big utility here thinks we can do it in 2040. So we are even ahead of California when it comes to those standards now. So mm-hmm. we've got a governor who's really taking the lead here. Well, that's that's pretty exciting. Yeah. yeah. We're first in something for a change. Oh, well, that's that's even more exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and you know, we talk about sustainability and it's it's not really an outlier anymore. And you know, it used to be sort of this fringe thing. And, you know, especially in the investment world, it's no longer an outlier. And um, more large corporations are moving towards sustainability practices. We see government, you know, even locally here, especially in the city of Santa Fe, um, making it a priority. You know, I would even make that leap that more small companies are doing the same. So have you seen an increase in local companies moving towards more sustainability practices? Absolutely. And you know, living here in Santa Fe, we, we might be a little out of the first standard deviation when it comes to people looking at sustainability. Right. We have a very progressive minded community and a very environmentally connected community. So I think that the mindset has always been there about being sustainable, but it, governmentally, now it's a little easier. It makes more sense on the bottom line with some of the policies that are in place, some of the utility, uh, especially with water, some of the things that have been put into place. But we've had great companies here like uh, Meow Wolf, which is a, a hit everywhere. And they, right. they just finished raising $157 million in order to 
keep their expansion going. And they've got sustainability in their DNA when it comes to their business practices, the things that they're doing with their facilities, their, uh, their employees are very tuned in to how are we going to do this right and how are we going to do this in a sustainable way. And um, it, it's, you know, they are somebody that came on board in the last couple of years, but they've already ingrained that into their corporate culture. We have companies like Descartes Labs that is doing, you know, things that are way, way over my head. But with da- data imagery and that kind of breakdown that they can do with old satellite photos and new satellite photos, they are very much entering into the world of sustainability. And then you have the, you know, the naturals like a reunity resources goes around collecting food waste and turns that into compost. So I think, you know, we're a small community, but we've got a lot going on that way. Yeah. And and this is a small community. It's roughly 80,000 people, but um, you mentioned some very small companies, although I I think Meow Wolf is well over 500 employees at at this point, which is huge for this community. Uh, And as an arts cooperative, which is what they really started out being, um, that's that's a huge employer at this point in this city. And and I do find what they're doing very fascinating. And, you know, for people who don't know what Meow Wolf is, it's, it's a very fascinating arts installation, but they are expanding beyond the state to um, the, Las Vegas and Denver and DC. DC and Texas. And, you know, it's, it's very interesting. So the fact that they are growing so rapidly and have sustainability in mind is amazing. I, so, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm astounded because it really, it's hard to describe what Meow Wolf is. You just have to go to their website because it's in, you can't describe it. You can't describe it. And, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if in the not too distant future, they are a publicly traded company. It, you know, it would be interesting to see how quickly and how fast that happens. I, I think so. you're right uh, the, with the financing they've just received and, their growth. And, you know, there are rumors around town because they're an entertainment and an experiential commodity. Right. And, and there are some big companies out there that right. that have done that for decades that may yeah. just scoop them up. Right. So if you aren't from Santa Fe and you come to Santa Fe, it is a must visit place. So yeah, definitely go do that. And, and while we're talking about jobs, uh, you know, have you seen job growth happen in the areas of sustainability uh, and and companies that are promoting sustainability? Because, you know, I I think Meow Wolf is a perfect example um, of of job growth and the sustainability piece, because I think they really do promote that. But what about other areas and and companies that are, you know, definitely much smaller? Do we see the sustainability piece promoting job growth in this community? Uh, to some extent, you know, we have, you know, the obvious renewable energy companies and particularly solar, which uh, was seeing astounding growth up until last uh, 2017 when the 10% tax credit lapsed here in New Mexico. And so they only had the 30% federal tax credit. And I'm thinking, you know, if we get that tax credit back, then that'll bring that back up. But they did see a decrease in the number of jobs over the last year, I think, due to that. Mm-hmm. But it's still been a pretty steady growth sort of um, industry. Wind is not really anything in Santa Fe, but we do have some companies that are involved with wind that have their offices here. That's going to be, I think, a growing industry. One of the things that we are looking at is the Green Chamber of Commerce moving forward is an energy efficiency uh, initiative to really bring businesses in. And energy efficiency is, in some places, has been growing faster than the actual production of energy. So those kinds of things, I think, are potentially there. Uh, we haven't really hit there yet in terms of you know being really sustainably oriented businesses and their growth. As you pointed out, we're a small town, so you, know, you, add, you add a job at the the company that picks up French fry grease and turns it into biodiesel. That's some pretty steady growth. 
right. If you have two employees and you add a third, that's a 50% growth. So, right. Yeah. And, and, you know, the other thing too is, you know, when I think about our local community college, which has a lot of sustainability programs for education, I I think there's a lot of potential there. Uh, And I, I find that an amazing feat for our small community college. It's pretty amazing. And and you're right. I think we haven't really uh, realized that growth yet, but it's, it's, we're building for it and we're, you know, we've got so much going on. Uh, we need, again, that government support, I think with some LIDA grants and to keep them here, like we did with Descartes lab and, and Meow Wolf and, you know, Pebble labs, which is this sort of unknown, entity here in Santa Fe that's going to be doing huge things mm-hmm. and, and keeping them here is you know, always the, the challenge. Right. And, you know, thinking about those, those, those particular companies and, and the fact that they, they do tend to focus on uh, sustainability issues and things like that. Do you, do you tend to think that green businesses or sustainable businesses tend to be a little more innovative in their practices? Uh, and, and what I mean by that is, um, do you think they're leading the pack? Do they tend to build a better mouse trap? And, and I, I don't mean just in the energy sector being innovative, because we know that that is an innovative sector. Um, but but what about other industries? And I, I tend to think about things like food service. And you mentioned like the French fried grease and, you know, that, right. that kind of thing. But, uh, but what about the you know, the hotel industry, are they, are they being more innovative in their business practices? Um, and, and what about something to do? Well, when we think about the hotel industry, are they, are they being more innovative, uh, innovative about water usage? Because we have a big water issue here in the Southwest and in Santa Fe. So, so what do you think about that? Well, I think you nailed it. Um, first of all, for people that aren't that familiar with Santa Fe, we are, a major tourist destination. That's our biggest industry here. Um, You know, if you look in travel uh, magazines, we're usually the number two or number three destination in the world uh, and certainly in the country. So we have millions of people or right at about a million people who come into our city every year and use our resources. And so that became a big deal in uh, the locals mind decades ago. And I think, what we're seeing is not so much the creation of these innovations here, but that the food and the restaurants and the hotels are very eager to adopt these new innovations. You know, one of the things we've been doing with the restaurant pilot pro- project, which is you know talking about getting actual sustainability into businesses, is doing just what you talked about with water because it's so precious here in the dry southwest. And doing audits, making sure that that, leaks are detected, making sure that they're using water in a wise way. But we've had another peel off of that private or that pilot project where we are testing an artificial intelligent learning water meter, which just, I mean, artificial intelligence is above my actual intelligence, but it's, (laughs) uh, it, it learns every water outlet in a restaurant in about 20 days. And then it can tell you on a phone app that you have a leak or somebody left the sink running or somebody's using too much water in a certain outlet. And the restaurant owners are just fascinated by it. They want, they've become uh, Prius geeks is a term that I, I did a, maybe I invented when the Prius first came out, drivers were always looking to see if they could get up over 100 miles per gallon on the little dashboard. And the restaurant owners here in Santa Fe are really gravitating towards their phone apps and watching every drop of water that they're using. So I think that that, that sustainability mindset that we've always felt that is here in Santa Fe has now been given an opportunity to grasp it and, and really use it. I did not know about that project. That's Absolutely fascinating because not only are they saving water, but they're going to save money. And that's what sells them. Right. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, that's, that is not just a, a wonderful thing for, for the city and the Southwest, but for the business owner as well. So I imagine that's going to 
move across, not just from restaurants, but to hotels and other major businesses that use a lot of water. It is. We've, at the end of June, which is the city's fiscal year, we will have wrapped up the first year of the pilot. Going into the second year, we are, uh, we've set a high goal of picking up another hundred restaurants which in Santa Fe is substantial Yes, and starting on the hotels. The company, which is Upinor, it's a company out of Denmark that has contracted with a company in California called Finn plus P-H-Y-N to develop this artificially intelligent learning water meter is using Santa Fe as a pilot for the restaurants. They've developed it first for residential. So we're really the first ones that are applying it commercially. And they're working on the software now so that we can give it another shot with hotels because, you know, hotels have toilets and showers and sinks and, and yeah. restaurants themselves and, and, and no yeah. way to monitor someone's behavior. You know, you, right. somebody comes in and takes a 45 minute shower because it's not their water. Right. We need to learn those things through this meter. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. So at the end of June, you'll have a sense of how much water a restaurant say from the beginning of the project to the end. Yeah, we we're, we're starting to compile those reports right now from the fin units. The and the other we did 31 restaurants total the first go around. So only 7 of them are getting these units because they're okay. rather expensive. Yeah. But just in changing out aerators and certain water appliances and testing for leaks, we were able to calculate based on the EPA water sense numbers, what the savings would be with these 31 restaurants. And it's about 22 million gallons. Wow. That's impressive. In a year. So it's, it is impressive. Yeah. And I don't even know how many restaurants we have in Santa Fe, but it's substantial. It's about 400. Okay. That's more than I would think, but that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So if we can get that into every restaurant and then every hotel and, there's a lot of other businesses that also use a significant amount of water. We can really save a lot of water in the city. Uh, it's uh, it's amazing. You, know, you get you become a water wonk. I never thought I'd know what a toilet flapper was, but I do now. Yeah, <laughs> and which is when you look at these restaurants, and it's in the in the top three of every water usage. It's there's a toilet in there that isn't functioning properly, and it's, right. it could be a thousand gallons a night. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow, I'm very excited about that. That is an amazing project. It is. Yeah. And so that's what, you know, again, putting these these initiatives, instead of just talking about them, putting them into actual use is what I, I see as another evolution of the Green Chamber of Commerce because mm-hmm. now we can do uh, energy efficiency in these commercial outlets too. Right. Yeah, not just water, but energy. Right. And I know for a while there's been the food pilot project is that still going on the the, the it, it, trying to work on the local food yeah piece? i mean one of the low uh, i don't want to say low hanging fruit because that's a food metaphor but buying local anything right you know is such a uh, a basis of sustainability in any community and we did a pilot study on three foods because we are so heavily restaurant uh, based here in santa fe of flour, tortillas. Uh, in Santa Fe, you would expect tortillas to be high on the list. And, Absolutely. And eggs. And so we've gathered some data on what those numbers look like in terms of usage. And the second step, which I'm hoping to begin in the second half of this year, is to find out where that demand can be met in Santa Fe and then concentric circles in New Mexico, you know, 100 miles, 200 miles, 300 miles. And um, we'll see where that, that goes because it it really ties into everything else, the water usage. You know, we've done a little bit of looking into indirect water use. And a lot of people don't know how the, the tourism is really impacted by indirect water use because we bring in so much food for people who don't live here. And um, it's a significant amount of water, we think, you just don't know. That's, that's well, heavy and, data. Yeah, and then the transportation of that food and the carbon usage and all of that, Absolutely. which is which is very high. So, you know, we have to think about the the carbon factor of tourism. Yes, 
which is extremely high. It is. Yeah. And that, that's a big piece on it too. So, yeah. And, you know, when we talk about um, food and, you know, even though this is a small town, there are food deserts in this town. You know, we have Indeed. areas where, where, it, where there are places where people cannot walk easily to a grocery store right. um, or get fresh fruit and vegetables very easily. Even though we have an amazing farmer's market, there are still places where we do have small food deserts. And so we, we also want to think about that. And um, so looking at the food issue is probably also something that's very important for, I think, the Green Chamber to it is, yeah, partly and, pay attention to. Oh, yeah, because you're right. In, in We are a small town and the, the thought – and the notion of having a food desert seems so unlikely to most people, but we have parts of town where, as you pointed out, they're further away from markets and our public transportation may not service them as well as some other parts of the community. And, you know, I think out of that, there was a, a deep dive by the city and also the county into urban gardens and right. that kind of agriculture, which ties back into what you were talking about at the community college, because they've got, you know, a world leading aquaponics program out there that, you know, can supply fresh food year round to 10,000 people. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm very fascinated by, uh, there's a program here in Santa Fe. There's a, it's a nonprofit called mix right. and uh, they just announced their finalists for their annual business sponsorship program. And one of them is a food and fish farm, if I am getting that correctly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I was like, Oh, this could be very interesting uh, to see it. The, the finalists, uh, there were like 20 of them. Right. That is very, very wide, very big variety of, of finalists. But I was like, Oh, that would be great if we had an actual uh, fish farm here outside of the community college. So yeah. it's, you know, I think that has been perfected that, that closed loop system where you have the fish tank at the bottom in the water and the, the waste from the fish is pumped up into the, the plants and it's a, the perfect fertilizer and, right. and the greens and it just, uh, there's that innovation again. I, I, there's a lot of bad news climate change wise that keeps coming our way. And I keep hearing these things about innovation and, and I'm very hopeful. Yeah. And, you know, and that actually brings me to my next question, which, you know, we're, the city is very focused on reducing carbon and in their, their city sustainability plan. Uh, full disclosure, I was, I participated in that final plan on the uh, city's sustainability commission, but you know, we're, we're really focused on um, reducing carbon in the atmosphere. And I know business and government leaders have a lot to do with being for, you know, being in the forefront of that. And if we really want individuals to be involved, business and government have to be the leaders in that. So is there anything that you think that businesses should be doing that they're not yet addressing to to reduce carbon well specifically it's there are several things they can do in general i think businesses need to take the lead uh, i think if historically you have an you have activism and the activism has to pass through all kinds of things in terms of policy and legislation. And in almost every case, it's been business that has stepped up and said, you know, that's great, but get out of the way. You know, we're seeing that now with, uh, what is it? The 13 CEOs, uh, climate culture folks that are saying, you know, we need a carbon and tax dividend policy. We need to be taxed on carbon. Everybody needs to be taxed on carbon. I think it's that kind of Leadership. I think it's the businesses that are going to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, you even saw that happen 50 years ago with the civil rights movement. It wasn't until businesses decided, wait a second, if we're not serving a certain sector of the population, we're losing money. It makes sense for us to do that. And maybe they didn't do it for the right reason, but they did it. And once they did it, it 
things started happening. And I think it's going to be the same thing with large corporations. You know, as you point out, we're a small town. We have small businesses. And I firmly believe in grassroots making things happen. But it's those grassroots actions that make their way up. And suddenly, you know, BP and Shell Oil are going, yeah, maybe we shouldn't have done some of those things. Let's not do them anymore. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I think you're right. And, um, you know, businesses often do lead the way. And and sometimes it is a financial reason. You, right. Sometimes you have to make a financial case. And and that's fine if that's the way you get a business to lead the way. That's the way you get a business to lead the way. And that's that's okay, too. Yeah. So uh, any last thoughts, Glenn, uh, or issues I, I didn't bring up? Something you can think about that's important for Green Chambers to to be focusing on or any thoughts? Well, I, I think, again, if you, um, as a business person, if you take a step back and look at the things that you can do in your business and the things that you can support, they do make their way up and, and catch the attention of a bigger corporation. And sadly, you know, we're in a position right now where those corporations have more clout politically than we do. And you, you as a shareholder have clout within that corporation and you can Im impact the change from the grass grassroots and keep that in mind that, you know, what you're, what you're doing and what you're thinking and what you want can matter. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with me today. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah. Wonderful. Glenn, this was great. Thank you. And uh, of course, Kim, thank you for bringing Glenn in. Oh, it, it was my pleasure. I've known Glenn for a long time. He's, he's a great guy. All right. I can tell. Fantastic. And thank you all for listening to the Deep Impact Investing Podcast with Kimberly Grego kyle If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Kim comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This will make it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Now, we'd like to take just a moment to thank our sponsors. Yes, um, we have three sponsors for this podcast today. The first one is Calvert. Calvert Research and Management is a global leader in responsible investing. Calvert Research Management is a global leader in responsible investing. Calvert sponsors one of the largest and most diversified families of responsibly invested mutual funds, encompassing active and passively managed equity, income, alternative, and multi-asset strategies. With roots in responsible investing back to 1982, the firm seeks to generate favorable investment returns for clients by allocating capital consistent with environmental, social, and governance best practices, and through structured engagement portfolio companies. Our second sponsor is pa Pax World Funds are advised by Impax Asset Management LLC, formerly Pax World Management LLC, a pioneer in the field of sustainable investing. Pax offers a diversified lineup of mutual funds focused on the risks and opportunities arising from the transition to a more sustainable global economy. Each fund integrates environmental, social, and governance research into the investment process to better manage risk and deliver competitive long-term investment performance. Since 1971, Pax has made it possible for investors to pursue financial returns while having a positive social and environmental impact. And finally, our third sponsor is Trillium Asset Management, where we believe that companies that adhere to strong, positive ESG policies can increase profitability and develop a competitive edge. We have found that integrating ESG factors into investment process is the best way to deliver long-term risk-adjusted returns to our clients. We thank all our sponsors and thanks again for listening today. For everyone at Horizon Sustainable Financial Services, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Deep Impact Investing Podcast, the sustainable, responsible impact investing podcast that shows you how to get your voice heard. It's time to start investing like you give a damn. To ask a question that we can answer on an upcoming podcast, email us at info at horizonssfs.com. 
www.facebook.com or join the conversation on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash horizons sustainable financial services or give us a call at 505-982-9661. Don't forget to click the subscribe button to be notified when new episodes become available. The companies we may speak about during our podcast are not recommendations for investment only. You and your financial advisor can determine what the right investments are for you and your situation. Horizon Sustainable Financial Services is a registered investment advisor registered with the state of New Mexico and other jurisdictions were registered or exempted. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the host and or guest and do not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Horizon Sustainable Financial Services. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.